So with RAM prices skyrocketing lately and the job market looking worse and worse every month, some people might be put in a position where instead of buying a brand new PC, they might be better off just digging through their garage to resurrect a dusty old PC. Now if you're familiar with Linux, then you probably know that it's much more memory efficient than Windows is. But just how little RAM can you get away with on a modern Linux distro? Well today I'll be testing that out with just 2 gigabytes of RAM. And I'll also be playing some old but still surprisingly nice looking games such as Crisis and Metro 2033. Now, I want to ask a question before we get started. What was the last version of Windows to only use around 500 to 600 megabytes after logging in? Take a guess and leave your answers in the comments and then we'll come back to this question at the end of the video. Now if you were into PC building back around 2010, then you probably remember AMD's Phenom 2 X4 CPUs, which is what's inside this system. But honestly, it's somewhat of a Frankenstein build at this point. That's because it's gone through a lot of upgrades over the years. So let's quickly go through them. About 15 years ago, I purchased this motherboard RAM and CPU combo at Fry's Electronics. I built this PC for my parents, so even back then it wasn't high-end. But a number of years later, I upgraded the CPU to a Phenom 2 X4 945, which was a little bit overkill. That's because the motherboard is a Biostar A760G M2+, Plus, which has the AM2 Plus socket, not the AM3 socket. And the RAM is 2GB of Patriot DDR2 800MHz with timings of 44412. Now these Phenom 2 CPUs were compatible with both DDR2 and DDR3. So not only is the capacity holding it back, but the transfer speed is also holding back the CPU. But it could be worse, since most 800MHz RAM had a cast latency of 5, but this kit is rated for 4. So the low latency saves it from being completely horrible. But still, the RAM is definitely the bottleneck here. Now at some point I added a dedicated GPU, but this was mainly just to get an HDMI port to connect to a TV. At the time, the Radeon HD 5450 1GB was the cheapest card I could find that had HDMI. But later in the video, I'll be replacing it with a Radeon RX 6600, which might seem overkill for this old system, but you'll be surprised at how well it fits when running older games at 4K. Now the PC also has two more expansion cards. First is a 1 gigabit Ethernet card, since the built-in network is limited to 100 megabits. And the last card here is a PCI TV tuner, which does work in Linux. But let's move on to the storage now. Thankfully, this motherboard supports SATA, which means I'm able to use this SSD, which allows the system to feel pretty snappy and fast. An SSD is also important if the system ever needs to use swap space. Now I don't remember which model this case is, but since it's old and only fits 3.5 inch drives, I had to 3D print these brackets to keep the SSD in place. And finally, the power supply is a 950 watt Corsair that I got back in 2010 for an SLI build. Unfortunately, this is the only part that remains from that build. I sold everything else a long time ago, which I kinda regret now. But anyway, the power supply is still stable 15 years later, which is a testament to Corsair's quality from that era. But with that said, it can sometimes make a lot of switching noises depending on the load. So I wouldn't trust it with any of my other systems, which is why it ended up here in this one. Alright, sorry I spent so much time on this section, but it is kind of a weird build, so I felt the need to explain it. So now let's talk about distros and desktop environments. As many of you know, the desktop will have the biggest impact on memory use, but I was surprised to find that the distro can also make a small difference. Now when it comes to desktops, my personal favorite is KDE. However, it's definitely not the lightest on memory. The same goes for GNOME and Cinnamon, which is why I went with XFCE, which uses considerably less memory. Keep in mind there are other desktops that use even less memory, but you're sacrificing features and functionality if you go with one of those. So I think XFCE offers the best balance of being lightweight and functional. 
Now let's take a look at a chart I put together comparing the memory use of various distros with KDE and XFCE. The memory use was recorded after leaving the system on for 5 minutes after logging in, and the only application that was opened was HTOP in order to monitor the memory. So now let's go through the list and I'll give more details on each one. Let's start with Zubuntu, which is Ubuntu except it comes with XFCE by default. I actually wasn't able to launch the installer for Zubuntu 2404, so I ended up installing 2204 and then did a system upgrade to get it to 2404, and everything worked fine. Chances are the system was running out of memory for the 2404 installer, but it turns out most of the distros did not have that problem. After upgrading and rebooting, the RAM use was 585 megabytes. Now let's move on to Linux Mint XFCE Edition. I had zero problems installing the latest version of Mint and everything went smoothly. After making sure everything was up to date, I rebooted and again I let it sit for about 5 minutes before checking the memory. HTOP reported 653 megabytes, which is about 70 more than what Zubuntu reported. Next I tried Kubuntu, which runs the KDE desktop. I didn't have any issues installing it, but not surprisingly, memory use was much higher than the others at 843 megabytes. Next I tried Endeavor OS, which is one of my personal favorites. Endeavor OS is based on Arch, but it uses a GUI installer and comes preloaded with some very sensible applications and configurations. But I should point out that if you want to install Arch on 2GB of RAM, you're probably better off going with vanilla Arch and using Arch install since that doesn't contain a GUI and uses less memory than the installers in other distros. This was a problem when trying to use the online installer for Endeavor OS, which ended up crashing and gave an error message saying it ran out of memory. Thankfully the offline installer ran fine. But this comes with KDE so I had to manually install XFCE afterwards. The memory use with KDE was 825 megabytes, which surprisingly is lower than Kubuntu. Now to switch to XFCE, all I had to do is run this command, reboot, and then I was able to choose XFCE at the login screen. And surprisingly enough, running Endeavor OS with XFCE provided the lowest memory use out of all the distros I tested, at only 567 megabytes. I didn't expect an Arch distro to be more efficient than Ubuntu with the same desktop. Now one last tip about the installation before we move on. If you plan to install Linux on a low memory system, make sure to enable swap with hibernation, which will create a large swap partition and ensures your system doesn't crash if it runs out of memory. You can also select swap to file instead of hibernation, but the swap will be too small to really be useful unless you manually increase it on your own. Now that I've settled on a distro, let's see how it actually performs starting with LibreOffice and YouTube videos and Firefox, and then afterwards we'll try some gaming. So here we see memory use is 872 megabytes, and that's because I've already opened and closed several applications, so the system is keeping some of that memory in case I reopen those programs. But now let's open LibreOffice Writer and some of the other Office apps. After opening Rider, we're now at 1GB exactly. Now let's keep this open and also open Calc. The memory use barely went up. Now let's open Impress. And I'll go ahead and select a template. Now let's check the memory, which is sitting at 1.14GB. Now of course these applications are mostly empty right now and the memory use would be higher if I actually had real projects opened. But honestly, most Office projects are pretty light on memory. Now let's open Firefox while keeping these apps open. And going back to HTOP really quick, we can see the CPU is busy but not completely maxing out. And memory use seems to settle at 1.27 gigabytes. Now let's watch a video. Let's see one of my videos. This is a good one, my playlist on Practical Electronics and Circuits 101. If you haven't watched it yet, you definitely should. 
and it seems to be settling right at 1.4 gigabytes. And the swap is only using 27 megabytes. So yeah, you can see web browsing and basic applications such as Office are completely usable with only 2 gigs of RAM. Of course, you probably won't be able to have dozens of tabs open in Firefox, but still, this is definitely usable. Okay, now let's move on to gaming. Up until now, I've been running this system with the HD5450, which is adequate for YouTube videos, but it's not a good choice for Linux gaming since it's too old to support Vulkan. However, like I showed in one of my shorts where I installed Linux on a MacBook and used its integrated Intel GPU, it is possible to run games using OpenGL instead of Vulkan. This worked well for the integrated GPU, but unfortunately the HD5450 has poor performance with OpenGL. Here you can see it struggling to run Half-Life 2, which is a game that it should easily be able to handle at 60 FPS and higher settings. But that's with DirectX, not OpenGL. So let's ditch the HD5450 and try a more modern GPU. Here I have an RX 6600, which should provide more than enough performance for this system. However, something to point out is that this GPU has a PCIe 4.0 x8 interface, while the motherboard has a PCIe 2.0 x16 slot, which means the GPU is only going to run at PCIe 2.0 x8 speeds. This is the equivalent of running a PCIe 1.0 x16. Which might seem bad at first, but keep in mind I'll be playing games from an era where PCI 1.0 was still common. So it shouldn't be an issue, especially since the GPU has a ton of VRAM and is overkill for these games. But anyway, let's jump into the game now. I also installed Game Mode which is useful for older CPUs, and I also installed Goverlay which is providing the statistics overlay. I also overclocked the GPU and increased its power limit to 120. So now let's take a quick look at the graphics settings. Right now I have the resolution set to 4K, and all the settings are on very high except for shadows. I should also mention that even though the game is running at 4K, my capture card is only capable of recording at 1080p. So here we are near the beginning, and I've just taken out the guards that were here. If I get up and close to the flare and then pause, we can see the GPU is actually maxed out and reaches its power limit, while providing a frame rate of about 50. Also, none of the CPU cores are being maxed out and RAM use is sitting at 1.7 gigabytes. It's clear that the game is GPU bound here. But now if I unpause and look down this way and then pause again, we see the FPS has dropped to 41, but the GPU usage is only at 76%. Meanwhile, none of the CPU cores are being maxed out either, which indicates that performance is being held back by the memory speed. But this shouldn't be a surprise since we already knew that DDR2 would bottleneck this CPU. Sometimes the bottleneck is the GPU, while other times the bottleneck is the CPU, so it's interesting how well balanced this system is while running the game at 4K. So now let's see what happens when I drop the resolution to 1080p. Now the game is in a purely CPU or RAM speed bottleneck, while the GPU is barely being utilized. But it's interesting how the frame rate isn't much better. There are moments when it goes over 60 FPS, which it wasn't able to do at 4K, but generally speaking the FPS still stays between 40 and 60 just like before. Now let's fast forward to this section right after the sunrise, and we can see performance has tanked below 30 FPS, and this is at 1080p. Now many people might say that this is because the game was poorly optimized. Keep in mind this game pushed the boundaries of what was possible graphically, but it was made during a time when DirectX didn't support some of these advanced features, so the developers had to use the CPU to process these effects instead of the GPU. Also the game was designed for dual core CPUs, and the developers assumed that the clock speed of CPUs would continue to increase over the years. But instead, CPUs started to get more cores instead of pushing the clocks. Which is why even newer CPUs have a hard time running this game at high frame rates. 
So now let's try another game that was also impossible to run when it was first released, Metro 2033. And it certainly doesn't disappoint even today. Here you can see the game running at 4K maxed out settings and it's only getting 26 FPS in the main menu. But if I change the API from DirectX 11 to DirectX 10, the difference is like night and day and it's now able to run at 60 FPS. So I'll just keep it on DirectX 10. The bottleneck in this game seems to be the GPU, but performance in this area is surprisingly stable at 60 FPS, with some sections going up to the 70s. That is, until we get to this scene where performance tanks to the 30s. But to be fair, these particle effects are still impressive today. So I think the RX 6600 is doing a good job considering this is at 4K. And once the door closes, the frame rate goes back up above 60 FPS. But again, notice how the GPU is consistently maxed out. The CPU is holding its own and is able to keep the GPU busy. And more importantly, RAM use is sitting at only 1.3 gigabytes. I'm actually really surprised at how well this hardware meshes together when running these games. So now let's circle back to the question I asked at the beginning. Which was the last version of Windows to use around 500 or 600 megabytes of RAM after booting up? And I don't mean after doing a bunch of tweaks and registry hacks. I mean a stock system. Well, I didn't test it myself, but I did a little research and found this article talking about Windows Vista, which was released in 2007, the same year that Crisis came out. According to this, Windows Vista can run on as little as 512 megabytes of RAM, in which case it'll use around 400 megabytes after booting up. But if your system has 2 gigs of RAM, then Windows will eat up nearly half of that all on its own. The article closes out by saying if you need to run memory intensive tasks, they suggest switching to Windows XP. So in other words, if you want to run an official Windows operating system that's as lightweight as a Linux distro from 2025, you'll need to install Windows XP, an operating system that's now over 24 years old. You won't be able to run any modern software, you won't be able to install Steam, you won't even be able to install a web browser that's capable of watching YouTube videos. In fact, simply connecting a Windows XP machine to the internet today is a security risk because Microsoft stopped supporting it a long time ago. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this little experiment today. It turns out Linux has no problems running on just two gigabytes of RAM, and it's even enough to do web browsing, watch YouTube videos, use lightweight applications such as Office, and even run some older games. But it's not exactly a great experience, especially if I wanted to do multitasking. So, for example, there were, some, there were a few moments in Crisis where the RAM use approached 2 gigabytes. So if I wanted to, like, open a YouTube video and listen to music while playing the game, well, that would probably be a problem. The system would need to eat into swap space and that'll take a big hit on performance and likely cause stuttering. So, I think four gigabytes is better, but to be honest, I think eight gigabytes is the bare minimum today. So for example, if I were to, if I was in the market for a thin and light laptop, then eight gigabytes would be the absolute minimum for me. But more than likely, I would shoot for 16 gigs just to be comfortable and have more of a future-proof system. Now for gamers, uh, if you want to future-proof your gaming rig and you're just mainly playing games, I would stick to either 32 or 48 gigs. You really don't need more than that. Unless you're running professional applications that actually need it. But in that case, you don't need me to tell you what you need. So. Again, for gamers, I wouldn't go past 32 or 48 gigs. But yeah, I mean, who's buying RAM these days anyway? With prices how they are, it's absolutely crazy. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there's any relief in sight. And in fact, other components are probably going to go up as well as all this AI madness continues. But anyway, that's all for today. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.